you like me and many other people across the world, you enjoy ordering items on a well, well-known website called Amazon. Four or five times a month or even a week. Getting things shipped to us seems like the new thing of the era because of the easy click of a button instead of get, getting up off the couch, getting in our cars and to the store. Although this may lighten our, your load and appear as though it's helping cut back on carbon emissions by not using your car as much, it just passes the problem to the next person, in this case, Amazon. Throughout the 21st century and the late 20th century, uh, society has done a lot of pushing the problem around instead of attempting to solve the problem of the increasing carbon emissions in our atmosphere. With the introduction of electric cars, many people thought that this problem would magically disappear, not realizing that they were just interchanging their plug. Instead of a gas pump, uh, they would plug into an outlet powered by power plants, burning the same thing. Now, don't get me wrong, electric cars do help to an extent, but they do not entirely fix the problem. Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Neese. Uh, thank you for joining me today, and I will be presenting uh, my work on a new hybrid, harnessing the power of friction with cargo ships, addressing the problem of CO2 emissions right at its core. So just some background information into what this problem really is. For the past few decades, the world has been facing the looming challenges of reversing the start of a very big problem known as climate change, leading to the discussion and the advancement of renewable technology, which so far has not been successful enough. My objective was to address this problem right at its roots, being the cause of CO2 emissions, and improving the design of cargo ships, one of the main contributors to carbon, carbon emissions, which produces over 1 million metric tons of carbon dioxide every year. Why cargo ships, you may ask? Well, over 30 million tons of goods are shipped around the globe daily, and at any given time, there are over 50,000 cargo ships crossing the ocean. The purpose of this project was to improve the efficiency of cargo ships by exploring energy harvesting systems that could collect energy generated between the hull of a ship and is moving across the water. The solution stems from the piezoelectric effect where certain materials can generate an electric charge in response to applied mechanical stress. Before we get into that, let's zoom out and, and look at the bigger picture. What impact does a hybrid cargo ship have on the whole world? The international shipping industry is responsible for the carriage of around, uh, of around 90% of world trade without shipping intercontinental trade, the bulk transport of raw materials, and the import or export of affordable food and manufactured goods would simply not be possible. With this beneficial system, there also comes many risks that could deeply affect the environment. One of the most detrimental to our oceans are oil spills. Groundings, shipwrecks, accidents, or fires can release oil into sensitive habitats, which are known to affect species, homes, and lifestyle. It's so important to preserve our ecosystems as they clean our water, purify our air, maintain our soil, regulate the climate, recycle nutrients, and provide us with food. They provide raw materials and resources for medicines and other purposes. They are at our foundation of all civilization and sustain our, our economies. The world has turned toward renewable energy, clean energy, as a way to combat the growing problem of climate change. Right now, there are many different types of harvesters sourcing from solar, wind, and hydropower. Solar is one of the most popular harvesters at the moment because of their major benefit, that they have virtually no footprint due to their ability to be placed on a roof or a tower. This means they have no impact on the environments they are placed in, and solar's limitations, however, vary by date, season, setup and orientation, and time of day. Also, since they are roughly 12, since there are roughly 12 hours of the daylight in one day, it is only generating electricity for roughly 50% of the day. Wind turbines are another popular form of renewable harvesters. However, they are known to be as dependent on weather conditions as solar because of their reliance on the wind. Turbines be begin to produce energy at wind speeds at, of at least six to nine miles per hour and only operate at around 30 to 40% efficiency throughout an average day. As wind, as wind harvesters are being developed and improved, there is no foreseeable solution to the problem of the size and its impact on the environment. The installation of wind turbines requires enormous machinery, which results in the destruction of land around it due to its big size and height. Next, water turbines are, are hydroelectric.
Next, water turbines are hydroelectric dams, function similar, similarly to wind turbines, where a shaft is spun to create kinetic energy, which is then converted to electrical energy. However, the main difference between both systems is their structure and dependency. Hydroelectric dams are enormous structures, usually made out of cement, uh, that hold water at a higher level than, and then use the forward force caused by gravity to divert the water into a chamber where the turbine is then turned and the water is released into a lower tower. That, uh, the downside of hydroelectric dams are that they are massive projects to carry out and require a great amount of machinery to construct, affecting the environment tremendously. As renewable harvesters are being developed to maximize space and utilize other features of the earth, they are becoming more efficient, but still not enough to combat the increasing problem of energy production emitting CO2 into our atmosphere. An example of future renewable technology is one of my other projects, the coral reef harvester, uh, dual harvesting system. The coral reef is a development of existing harvesters integrated into one, taking the best concepts and applying them to an ocean-based system. With wave production being fairly constant, and solar panels that rotate with the sun's movement throughout the day, the system utilizes the space it occupies and is also producing the electricity due to its dual components. Although dual harvesters seem to be the future of renewable technology, it will actually be something completely new, a new approach that will attempt to conserve our lost energy instead of the environment's lost energy. Kinetic energy is due to the motion, due to mo kinetic energy is due to motion energy that one possesses when moving. Certain materials will generate an electric charge when they are placed under mechanical stress. Putting, two, putting the, both of those sentences together, when an object pushes on a certain material, it will generate electricity. New technology gives the ability to collect lost energy from our everyday movements in many different forms. This new way to generate electricity has been implemented into floors, preserving the lost energy when people go walking or running on the sidewalks and inside buildings. However, this is not a new idea, but more of a new application for an old idea. This form of energy generation is called piezoelectricity and is actually used in buzzers, speakers, microphones, and many other electron electronic devices that we use on a daily basis. As kinetic-based harvesters do not depend on weather or any uncontrollable factor, they appear to be better, uh, a better and more realistic solution to the growing problem of climate change. The question is, how can we implement this into many of our daily activities to maximize its potential? Piezoelectricity works by flexing crystals between two similar objects, converting mechanical energy caused by stress tension or compression into electrical energy. I originally started out using piezoelectric disks. However, in order to fit my design, I created my own piezoelectric plates with zinc oxide. Zinc oxide is one of the several piezoelectric compounds. Uh, it works because of its hexagonal shape, as you can see on the board. Um, it, if a force is applied to the hexagon, the array is compressed, which, begin, which brings two of the positive charges closer to each other uh, at one end and the negative charges to the other. This forms a dipole where one end of the array is positive and the other is negative. This technology can easily be integrated into the whole of a cargo ship utilizing the pressure of both the water and the boat pushing on each other. As waves slap up against the side of the hull, these plates will become compressed for a moment and produce electricity, which can then be collected into a battery. But this seems like we're creating energy in an infinite loop, generating electricity as the ship moves across the water. Uh, across the water from the movement across the water. And yes, when we put it like that, it breaks the law of conservation of energy. That energy is neither created nor destroyed. However, if you look closer at the application, it is actually being powered by the waves slapping the side of the boat, thus conserving wave power into electricity, not creating new energy. With further research on drag and net energy collection, I would be able to confirm that this, is, this in fact works. My first design was the PEX system, an acronym for piezoelectric cargo ship, and named after the pe pectoral muscles, which improve the stability and structure of one's upper body. This design met my goal and has the ability of generating electricity through the pressure between the boat and the passing water. It consists of one piezoelectric disc, 
of which as stated before are small metal plates with piezoelectric crystals, um, quartz crystals in between them. And when pressure is applied to the disc through flexing the plates, the crystals are forced to, forced to shift causing an electrical charge. Initially, I started out with a simple circuit cons consisting of a piezoelectric actuator and a diode to maintain a one direction system, all directly charging a small capacitor, which was connected to a switch and an LED diode. To show the, this shows the generation of electricity that was successful. I found that this circuit layout required a lot of force over a long period of time in order to charge the capacitor, only achieving a minuscule two volts electricity. And after about a week of testing, I saw after a more effective system through further research on piezoelectric discs. What does that sound? And as you can see here, uh, it's the, it generated two, uh, 2.48 uh, millivolts with that small production. What's that sound? Yep. In my deeper analysis on piezo technology, I discovered that the piezo discs generated AC current, um, which could be my problem when trying to charge the capacitor. After integrating a four-way diode rectifier to convert AC to DC, it did not take much effort to light up the LED, and I was able to maintain a two-volt current while pressing on the disc. My second design, improving the original design of the PEX system, uh, consists of multiple of my own piezoelectric plates with a realist, realistic design. These piezoelectric plates consist of zinc oxide between two copper plates. Zinc oxide being a piezoelectric compound is able to generate electricity with its compression, charging the plates on either side. My final wiring integrated a breadboard with the same configuration of, as the PEG system one, uh, but also consists of multiple piece of plates, which required more playing around with to get right. In order to have a successful generation of electricity, with multiple plates, I had to set them in, a par in parallel and place a diode between each to maintain a one direction flow. As there were difficulties in getting my design printed on an available 3D printer, I could not test the outcome of this circuit on a model boat and cannot say whether this worked better or worse than the original PEX system, but I, it did prove that the piezoelectric effect could be applied to, uh, to a larger, larger scale setting with my own design of piezoelectric plates. With my final design coming to a halt after, 3D, after the 3D printer trouble and not being able to test my design, I will base my conclusions off my original PEX system uh, design and data. So I know some of you are thinking, how, how cost effective is this system? Well, as the gas prices continue to soar, a trend we've been seeing for a while now, uh, this system would pay off very fast. My rough calculations include that that there is somewhere around 78,000 square feet of charging space on an average cargo ship, and it would cost about $32 per square foot, leading me to an overall estimate of around two and a half million to cover from edge to edge with piezoelectric plates. I realize this might sound like a lot, but the system would only have to make up for one fifth of the normal fuel used. After research, I found that the fuel costs about $4 per gallon, more like six or seven, and these ships usually use three and a half million gallons coming out to a total of 14 million on fuel. Now, this is not the only time the system would generate electricity as cargo ships stay in ports for somewhere between one to three business days. The boat is always moving in the water and the system would have the ability to generate electricity, which could be plugged into the grid like a renewable energy harvester. There are several next steps I would definitely like to develop. The first being to test test this concept on a larger scale model, like a canoe or a kayak. This would help determine whether or not the system actually gains a positive amount of energy instead of consuming more than before uh, to generate a small amount of electricity. And this would help us test if my system causes increased drag between the boat and the water. I feel that this technology has so much potential, especially on ships, uh, which have never been considered for hybrid structures, and that it is necessary for the, uh, and it's a necessary step for the develop, development of our society, similar to the advance of hybrid cargo ships, and, uh, and similar to the advance of hybrid cars. 
And at this time, I would like to open up to any questions. Thanks, job, Michael. Thank you. Uh, that was very, very interesting. Um, and yeah, I'm glad you brought up at the end, like the whole issue of like drag, because like mm -hmm. on the outside of the ship, right? right? Um, so it'd be interesting to see, like we said, on a larger scale model, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> how much it would it would change things. Um, how did you come up with this idea? Yeah, so um, as you saw, I had the um, the uh, system on the outside. I don't know, it's not going to show up, but the um, coral reef harvester was my last year's project, and it kind of got me inspired to work harder and further in innovating toward finding a solution for the carbon emissions skyrocketing. And mm -hmm. I knew from past years that the ocean isn't really being utilized the way it could be. Um, we have a lot of energy loss in the ocean with waves slapping against the beaches, which is something that we could really use uh, to our advantage instead of just letting it sit there. There's a lot of ocean that's not used. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's a step closer instead of using the land that we, we need to use. Right. We can use something that we don't use as much. Very interesting. Um, <clears throat> what did you learn? Of, you know, this is your second capstone project, uh, which is really cool. <clears throat> Why do you why do you like doing capstone projects? Um, just being up here is really cool. I mean, I, I wish I memorized this. I just didn't have enough time. But it's I think it's really fun to be up here uh, with the clicker in your hand, just going through uh, with my passion, inspiring others to do change as well. I mean, innovating is is a very difficult thing to do, and to uh, like just show everyone your project is really it's it's a really fun thing to do. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and clearly you're exploring I, what I imagine is passions mm -hmm. of yours and maybe future passions. Um, or is this like kind of stuff you want to go into in college? Yes, yeah. Some sort of engineering, definitely not a com just sitting down at a desk. I want to be hands-on yeah. designing things. Yeah. Very cool. And so this round of capstone, what did you learn about yourself like as a learner just doing a capstone project? Mm -hmm. You got to keep pushing forward. Um, with my project, there was a lot of testing, research. There was really nothing out there about um, the piezoelectric effect of being applied to a ship or anything like that. I was mainly looking at abstracts, and mm -hmm. that was very difficult for me because I didn't have a direct source to go to and say, yeah, this works. Mm -hmm. I had to kind of make it from scratch, say, hey, um, I have to design this. Will this work? I don't know. Maybe we just have to test it. And I really had to push myself. You see, I had two stages here. Um, I had to first proof of concept. Second, I had to improve on that and see how I could do, uh, make it better and more efficient. Right. Very cool. Um, all right. Good job. Very nice. Thank you. Hello, my name is Zachary Hughes, and today I'll be talking to you about the effects of playing an instrument on the brain. Oh, because I touched it. Hello. 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 Playing an instrument um, in the brain, and then also the benefits of playing an instrument on the brain, as well as another topic that I found really interesting while I was studying um, and researching for this was the critical period period hypothesis. And finally, I'll get into some conclusions. No, it's not touch screen. Oh, it's not on. Yeah. There you go. All right. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a junior at Gilbert High School. I've been playing um, violin for 10 years. Uh, this was recently from the last Symphony Orchestra concert. And I've been playing um, guitar for seven years. Um, this is from another concert I had for guitar. Um, I've, I've been playing, so you can tell, I've been playing music for a long time. Um, it's been one of my passions and a big part of my life. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit about me. And now we'll go into a little bit about the project. Um, 
So about 74% of uh, adults in the world have played an instrument in their life. Uh, this is the majority of the world. So this raises a few questions about how playing an instrument affects the brain. Um, how, how does, um, or what's going on in the brain when you're playing an instrument? How does repeated practice of um, an instrument affect the brain and change the brain? Uh, and as noted, this is also a traditional childhood activity. So this is happening during the developmental years of your brain, which is why there must be some sort of um, change in the brain, uh, which is how I kind of got started with this project. So we'll go into a little bit more into that. Um, as you know, I have a pretty big passion for music since I've been playing so long. It's been a major part of my life um, and just how I've grown up as an individual. Um, along with that, I've had an interest in, interest in neuroscience for a very long time. Um, I remember in fifth grade, um, when I first got into neuroscience, uh, we were talking about sleep and REM cycles and stuff like that. So um, neuroscience has always been something I've been really interested in. And going off of what I did last year for Capstone, um, I looked at how uh, the use of digital technology affects the brain. So I've been really interested in neuroscience. Um, unfortunately, our school doesn't really offer any class in neuroscience, and so it's such a like, complex topic. So I've been using my Capstone time to really research and learn more about something that I'm really interested in. So let's go into some information about physical change. So the process of playing an instrument seems pretty simple to the person that's watching the audience. Unfortunately, it's really not that simple. There is a lot of inf information going into your brain and your brain is um, like sorting everything out just so that you can get, you can hear the music and hear it perfectly um, along with all the other people that um, depending on the instrument, there's a very complex process of how um, the brain processes all the information that's given. But here I'm just going to give a quick general um, kind of like pathway of the um, process of playing the instrument. So first you start with reading music. You, uh, the, the person playing sees the notes and has to internalize those notes. After reading the music, they have to assign the note um, in finger placement, which would be um, done in the broca area of the brain, uh, which is the main part for uh, music. But this part is almost like um, reading the language. When you read a book, you uh, have to internalize what the words are saying. So this is the same thing for music. When you're reading the music, you have to internalize what it's saying, which also aligns with assigning note and finger placement. The next thing would be rhythm and tone processing. Um, a big part of playing an instrument is being able to understand um how to make a good sound and so this is really where you're going to hear that and where that's going to happen is getting or is aligning the rhythm and aligning the tone so that you can produce the sound that you want to hear and then finally you have fine tuning uh, this can be anything from motor fine tuning so like fine tuning your finger placement or fine tuning how your width uh, the vibrato you use on a certain note it could be really anything but this fine-tuning fine part is really what produces the sound and causes um, someone to actually hear the sound how you want to hear. So this could also be like adding emotion to the music. Now let's go into a few of the areas that are developed by the brain. Um, unsurprisingly, many parts of the brain are developed by playing an instrument because of how much practice you need to be able to play it well. Um, so here I've just pointed out a few of the major differences in someone that's played an instrument for a long time versus someone that has an So starting um, with the Heschel's air, uh, gyrus, uh, this is a major part of the auditory cortex, uh, which processes uh, complex auditory information along with language comprehension. So this kind of has to do with the reading music part. Um, for music, this is also identifies, uh, I, this also includes identifying notes on a sheet of music um, to make sure you can figure out uh, and play the note correctly. Moving counterclockwise, we're going to go down to the Broca's area. Um, so the Broca's area is somewhat related to music in itself, as I said earlier. Um, along with that, it's also the area of the brain that is involved with uh, motor-related activities uh, with the hands and sensory motor learning. Um, this, this could, you can kind of tell why this would be developed because of how involved it is with playing uh, or using your hands to learn. And the next thing would be the inferior frontal gyrus. Um, this area contributes to higher cognitive function and working memory. 
Um, memorizing things is a big part of playing an instrument. You have to memorize actually how to play the instrument. So this is really where all your motor uh, memorization and uh, repetition kind of happens so that you're able to understand how to play the instrument and how to develop your skills on the instrument. The next would be the cerebellum. Uh, the cerebellum's main purpose is to regulate posture adjust adjustments in order to maintain balance, uh, along with accomplish goals at hand. Uh, this is a major part of playing the instrument and uh, because the player must have spatial awareness and be able to you know, hold themselves well so that they're able to play the instrument. The last part up here would be the superior parietal lobe. Um, the superior parietal lobe you know, main function is integrating functions from all over the brain. Um, along with the area that has to do with your sense of touch. So this kind of, the superior parietal lobe is important to everything because it really wraps everything together so that you're able to use um, every part of your body to make that music and really do anything to it. So now we're gonna go into the benefits and how really learning an instrument is important. So the benefits of The first would be uh, fine motor skills. Um, Fine motor skills are really important to daily life, and the early development of these only makes it easier for children to become more independent early on. Some examples of fine motor skills would be holding a pencil, tying your shoes, or just picking up an egg. The early development, because of playing an instrument, seems like something that's pretty minor, yet in reality, it's very important. As almost every instrument requires the use of both hands, it's important to note that the training of both hands helps balance out the abilities of each hand. Usually, most people tend to have less control and uh, strength in motor fine, fine motor skills on the non dominant hand. By playing an instrument, you're able to train and use your non dominant hand so that you're able to uh, use it just as well or even better than your dominant hand. The next um, thing that might seem like a hoax, but it isn't, is intelligence. Intelligence actually really developed because of playing an instrument. In the study of 4,600 people done in 2021, it was found that learning an instrument increases your IQ by 10%. Although this is still a largely debated topic on whether learning an instrument truly causes a person to become smarter, there are many recent studies that support the proposition that there is some sort of positive effect on intelligence in children who learn to play an instrument versus those who don't. Um, it has also been found in musicians that they tend to have a stronger set, sense of crystallized intelligence. Um, crystallized intelligence involves knowledge that comes from prior learning and past experiences. Usually this is found more in adults rather than adolescents and doesn't come until you get older. Um, so when, um, when you're playing an instrument, you use your prior knowledge to be able to play it better. Um, you use your prior mistakes to learn things um, and make sense of things better. And this can be seen not only playing an instrument, but playing a score or really doing anything, you learn from your mistakes. So that's really what crystallized intelligence is. And that's why it's so important um, to play an instrument because learning how to have this crystallized intelligence earlier allows you to make better decisions earlier on in your life. Next one would be increased memory capacity. Listening to music in general has been found to be a major contributor to a better memory. Uh, what was recently found though was musicians tend to have a larger memory capacity than not. This is mainly related to the fact that musicians are using both hemispheres of the brain while playing. This can be related to the findings for, that for musicians have, uh, the musicians at the, start at the beginning, and before the age of seven, their corpus callosum was significantly larger than musicians who started before. So what this is really saying is that um, when you use both hemispheres of the brain, you increase your memory capacity because the signals between both sides of the brain are able to move faster. Um, and this allows for you to understand more and be able to just collect more information um, outside of music. It's not really just related to music itself. Um, along with this, music also helps with clustering memory. Clustering memory is basically learning things as a group rather than just learning one individual thing. This can be, this is really developed because of um, when you play an instrument, you're not just playing each note, you're playing a passage, you're playing a few measures, or you're playing a whole piece. Um, and by doing that, um, you're not working on one individual note, you're working on the entire thing. So by developing that sense of learning everything together, you kind of, you're able to increase your memory and make it easier for you to learn other things. Um, for example, when you want to learn, let's say like a math equation, sometimes it's easier to just sing, a, sing it along with the song, make it a bit of a parody because of the way that it's easier to memorize. Um, 
something that has to do with music or something that has a rhythm rather than just memorizing one little note or one little word. Next thing would be reduce stress. Um, listening to music is one of the most efficient and effective ways to reduce stress. Um, for most of the same reasons, playing an instrument uh, is also an effective way to reduce stress. This is because playing an instrument can lower heart rate, release endorphins, and improve our sense of well being and distract us from whatever stressing us. And this all reduces uh, physical and emotional stress levels. By requiring all of your concentration, playing an instrument naturally creates a state of mindfulness. Which gives you a sense of calm. Uh, mainly, mainly playing the instrument lowers cortisol levels, which is known as a stress hormone. Another thing would be language acquisition. Um, stronger language acquisition is one of the most prominent benefits in playing music. This is mainly because of how closely related learning music and learning language are. The neural networks for both music and language overlap. Uh, this is mainly due to how brain processes uh, music and both music and language processing have the same cognitive building blocks. In two recent studies uh, from Stanford, it was found that people with music, musical experience normally find it easier to distinguish small differences in word, sy word syllables and sounds. This can be easily explained by the fact that in learning an instrument, you learn to have an increased sensitivity to pitch. This skill is extremely important to learning language acquisition as pitch is extremely crucial in different, differentiating words in certain language, languages like Mandarin. Another way that playing an instrument helps language acquisition is that it develops sound patterns. In playing music, your brain learns to understand patterns and rhythm and also heart rate. Uh, like music, languages also have many patterns. In them. By learning an instrument, you're able to learn how to extract these patterns, which makes it easier to identify patterns of speech. Mastering this skill also helps increase memory and strengthen your mental capacity, which is important for learning. Another big um, benefit of playing an instrument is music therapy. Um, playing, in, playing an instrument allows you to kind of give yourself music therapy as it does reduce stress, but it also has other benefits within music therapy. Um, music therapy has been used since the 1800s, yet nobody has really conducted research on how playing an instrument can act as music therapy in itself. The first thing to point out, though, is that learning and playing an instrument has been proven to shape a healthy it can even help fix the neural pathways of people with neurological impairments. Uh, many studies have found that playing instrument induces brain, brain plasticity to help overcome the developmental mental disorders like stuttering and Parkinson's disease, along with acquired brain injuries like a stroke. Besides that, there have been many advances in how playing an instrument can treat a uh, One form of music therapy that I found or read about was auditory motor mapping training, otherwise known as AMMP. Um, this this uh, therapy has been used for nonverbal children with autism. And um, basically what it does is it uses um, information in, in like words, in, in like groupings, rather than using um, like one single word or like asking questions to the child, they use music and learning instruments to help the child um, develop a sense of confidence, as well as develop a sense of like a place where they can show their emotions without having to actually say that. Um, and this has been found to be like, very, very uh, effective. Um, all the children that were uh, studied in this uh, showed significant improvement in their ability to articulate words and phrases. So after they were able to discuss uh, or after they were able to learn the instrument, be able to use it as like a place to show their emotions. Um, they were able to feel a little bit more confident and were able to start talking a little bit more and become more verbal and show their emotions and, and really overcome the challenges of autism. Um, and that was a study done at Harvard, um, which is very interesting because it shows how children are able to overcome um, something that might not be otherwise um, you know, attainable to be able to speak to other people um, through music. So how long do these effects last? Um, we're not all uh, professional musicians who play for since they were like three and play for the rest of their lives. So how long are we really getting these benefits? So what I found was about three years of music lessons fundamentally alters the nervous system, which means after you have music instruction for three years, you have 
all of these, basically all of these benefits to an extent, um, basically at your fingertips. Playing an instrument is so important to uh, developing the brain, especially at an early age, that you can have benefits like language acquisition and increased memory and increased, uh, increased intelligence. All these things are so important in only three years of time, um, how it fundamentally alters the nervous system. It's just a huge break in, in neuroscience. Now I want to talk a little bit about the critical theory hypothesis because it was something that I found really interesting in research. Um, so what is the critical theory hypothesis? Um, basically, the critical theory hypothesis is for language, but what they found was it also um, it applies to music. But a simple summary of it is that it's an ideal time window of brain development to acquire language. And this uh, image basically shows the ease of learning versus the um, how much how old they are. So it becomes it's easier to learn things um, as you, when you when you're younger. But as you get older, there's a certain period to which it gets harder to learn things. So they what the main goal of the critical theory hypothesis is is to show a specific time um, when learning an instrument or learning a language specifically is um, is is the best. So recently studies have shown that this applies to learning an instrument. Uh, which is really important because um, since since a long time ago, they've always had music starts in fifth grade or even fourth grade. And if we know when it starts, we can also figure out, hey, when is it better for um, to learn like a certain subject for math or for social studies or anything really. Um, so it shows us when can we decide uh, when to teach children things, when is it going to be easy to teach children things, which is a huge breakthrough in, in not only neuroscience, but in education, because um, music education is important, important, but it's not really a fundamental activity that everyone has to do. So if you can figure out when um, it's best to teach something, then we can have children that understand things easier from earlier on, rather than teaching things that are maybe harder to learn later. So that was, I basically talked about the importance there as well. Just a reminder before you but head to the Basically, you get stronger benefits of playing an instrument if you learn early. Again. And that's what we see with a lot of the professionals is they started when they were three or four, which seems kind of impossible, but it makes sense as to um, how they can develop as a person and a musician because it's so much easier to learn when you're little, which seems a little bit weird because, you know, you don't have as many skills to make not able to talk as much as you know someone that's a lot older and this yeah again this also doesn't just apply to music this applies to everything so that's why i thought this uh, was really important to add into the uh, presentation because it's not only just about music it's about um trying to make education better in general so let's talk about a few conclusions to that i learned that um the yeah, i learned the importance of learning an instrument so I had the advantage of starting violin at, um, in second grade, and I never really understood why it was such a big deal. My, my parents would always tell me, oh, that's, that's amazing, and people always say, wow, that's, that's really cool that you started so early, but I always saw it as a passion, something I was really interested in. But now looking back on it, I realized that it's really important to learn things early on, especially because of this critical theory hypothesis. You learn so many, it's so much easier to learn things and develop skills. Um, that not only apply to music, but also apply to everything, like school um, and just social social life in general. So um, I think playing an instrument and just doing this project really showed me how important it is to learn um, things earlier rather than later. Another thing that I was able to conclude was uh, the importance of learning early on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I kind of talked about it. <laughs> and then the next thing was, how little we know about our brains. And I really want to stress this because um, the brain is something that we just don't know that much about. And we think we do because, you know, it's in our body. We should know about everything that um, makes us. And what's interesting is that, and what I found was that there aren't that many studies on anything really in the brain. Even this niche topic, it was very hard to find sources at some points because of how specific it was, but also because of the, um, it's very hard to say, okay, this causes um, an effect in the brain. And sometimes it's 
sometimes in like other studies on different things like um, really anything related to the human body, it's a little bit easier to say things because it's more definite. You know the reaction. We can't really do tests yet that decide whether um, there are cause, there's a cause and effect relationship or we can generalize um, the effects to everyone because the brain is developing and mutating basically as um, generations keep uh, coming. Um, that's mm -hmm. something that I found was really interesting was that um, <clears throat> we don't know if um, these benefits that I was talking about today um, are truly because of playing an instrument or are they just generational mm -hmm. as they been passed down throughout the years. So that that's something that I have you have to take everything that I basically said with a grain of salt um, because they haven't really totally um, pinpointed all the causes and effects of playing an instrument um, and and how that really develops the brain. But we do know that it does change it. That's all. Very nice. Super interesting. Um, so with the critical period hypothesis, what age is the age at which children should be learning an instrument slash a language? I need to say that. So um, what I found was it really varies. Um, they're still doing a lot of tests on it, but um, they were saying for an instrument around six to seven years old. And once you get, they were saying like the cap would be around 10 to 14 years old. It was a very large range for some reason mm -hmm. to make the cap because it depends on the person. Like certain people might be more driven to learn things as well. Um, and it's very hard to generate or like to pinpoint a specific age mm -hmm. at which a person is um, or has passed the, the ease of learning mm -hmm. because it could be different for everyone. Right. Um, but for a language, it was about the same actually, but a little bit younger for uh, when you get older. But I've noticed like because I've been taking Spanish classes is that when I was younger, all the easier things kind of stick. And now it's harder to memorize words and to understand and just yeah. have vocabulary. So I think um, it really shows that learning earlier on, and I would say for language, it was a little bit lower. I think it was like four to seven mm -hmm. was like the, yeah. was like the uh, beginning and then it was around like eight or nine that um, peaks. Yeah, it really peaks and that's, and then it goes down from there. Yeah, that is really interesting. And almost like, we, they, like, I mean, my, I have my stepdaughters are in elementary school and they felt like a lot of our elementary school was like re repetition, like the months, the day, and that's like almost like they, sh they should front load more because of that like time of acquisition. Whereas like they save all of that stuff for when you guys are older and it's, you guys are like on the downward trend already. Right. And you get into that, um, it gets into like the ethical standpoint, like you want to give kids a ton of homework. Right. Like, that's the other thing is that um, you also have to think of, like, what, what is it like to be a kid? You don't, you don't want to give kids a bunch of homework. Right. It's very important for them to learn things early on, like languages. Like, if, yeah. I, if I had the opportunity to go back, I would definitely be trying to learn as much as I could for a language because it's just so important now yeah. to have another language, having other skills, like learning an instrument, you know, doing other things that um, just the benefits are, are so large mm -hmm. that it's just really important to do that. So that would be something I would want to do is go back and learn the language or, you know, spend more time um, involve myself in other activities just because of the effects that have everything we have. Yeah. And yeah. Elements. Very interesting. Um, stepping away from the content, what did you learn about yourself as a learner doing this capstone project? Well, I learned a lot about um, pushing off deadlines, um, but this year um, it was very stressful with AP stuff at, like, all the time, tons of homework, everything, tests here and there, AP exams, SATs. It was a very stressful year, so it was really hard for me to get through this at certain points. Mm -hmm. um, and so I definitely um, learned that it's really important to set deadlines for yourself earlier on <laughs> um, because it, then you're more motivated to do it. Um, as well as that, I need to sit away from people and study all because I talk <laughs> a lot. Um, but other than that, yeah, that's, that's basically what I learned about some Time management. Yeah. Go ahead. I, but definitely learned a lot about neuroscience, which is what the main goal was. And it was really nice to be able to combine both of my passions. Absolutely.
And without further ado, Zoe Beckman and her capstone presentation. All right, cool. Um, can I point it somewhere? Right at the computer. <laughs> Try again. All right, cool. Uh, all right, cool, it works. All right. Hi guys, uh, welcome to my capstone presentation. Before I begin, I just wanted to give a big thank you to all my advisors, Mrs. Sullivan, Ms. Cook, and Ms. Khaleesi for helping me with this project, and Ms. Phillips for allowing me the opportunity to present to this class. Um, my capstone presentation is, as you could probably guess, all about an inclusive queer sex ed education, or queer sex ed. Well, my goals for this project have definitely shifted quite a bit since I started. Uh, I knew that I wanted to teach an improved and inclusive queer sex ed to as to people as far as I could reach them. Uh, while I'm not a professional, I really hope that people would listen to me due to my experience as a queer teen in this country. To begin with, I have always have felt a really active pull towards the gay rights movement. Um, since I came out in eighth grade and probably sometime before, um, I'd always felt this pull also to the social justice system. So much so that when I was in eighth grade and I had to write an argumentative essay, I had decided to talk for a whole 10 minutes about my passion and LGBTQ rights. While it isn't that long compared to today's 20 minutes, it was definitely longer than war and peace in my mind. Um, that speech definitely had an impact on how I was choosing my capstone idea. While I had an amazing teacher and access to people like me who have the same sexuality as me, I really helped to be a role model to other people. My speech in eighth grade gave me such an adrenaline rush for two weeks that I even asked to present it in front of the entire middle school, and I even asked the principal. Sorry about that. Um, I was quite the energetic eight-year-old who evolved into this, <laughs> and that's when it probably started. <laughs> um, and while I'm lucky to have the support system that I do, I really had no clue how I was going to mirror that for somebody else. I had already done it. I really had chosen the best idea that I could possibly do, and I had no idea where to go after that. I could make a podcast, I could write a speech again, we already knew that worked, and I could even just make a slideshow. But none of that had the appeal that I really wanted. So after a lot of thinking, I started an Instagram page that revolved around teaching adolescents gay or straight about lessons about the LGBTQ community that I really wish that I had learned years ago. When I came out as gay, no one was able to silence the questions that my brain had. The only thing that really worked for me was research. There were so many conflicting points. With that, I got the information, but it was definitely a hard process. I had to weed out the stupids and the bigots, and I had to sort out the good from the bad. My hope for this project is for me to be the easiest way to help those who have no idea where to start like I did. I was dedicated to helping those become more educated on matters that couldn't be taught in a classroom. This was due to the fact that many would protest against the idea that LGBTQ education needed to be taught in the first place, and that many would protest the ideas that were being talked about. Some of those included STD rates in LGBTQ youth, or mental health rates, or to find binders that fit you and your price range. I informed my viewers, and, okay, a little bit weird. Um, <laughs> I told my viewers to leave comments to, or advice to others in a way that could really help people. Very quickly, I received support from people on the other side of the country, and they even asked me questions. But what else really inspired me? Um, like most other teenagers or anyone sane, I turned to my best friends. Like me, not understanding the bare minimum of dangerous situations that arise in the community was a sore, sore spot for them as well. We agree that there are so many non-credible sources and I hope to weed them out to help a large number of people, including them. Unfortunately, however, um, halfway through my project, I learned about the Don't Say Gay Bill. I would like to do it here. Okay, thank you. Um, if you didn't know, the Don't Say Gay Bill, officially known as the Parental Rights and Education Bill, was passed this March and was made to, quote, allow parents to determine when and in what way to introduce LGBTQ topics to their children. This bill also allowed parents to sue the school if it was violated. The new law prohibits school from enacting policies that prevent critical decisions affecting a student's mental, emotional, or physical health or well-being from being disclosed to parents. Certain information could still be withheld from schools if they believed it would lead to abuse, neglect, or abandonment. However, despite the fact that this sounds nice, 
the law stigmatizes being gay or transgender and may harm LGBTQ youth's mental health as they are already more likely to be bullied and attempt suicide than cisgender and straight children. Additionally, the legislation uses derogatory language to describe aspects of gender identity and sexual orientation that are not heteronormative, such as not being cisgender and heterosexual. When it was finalized and passed in Florida, I was even more determined to help those who have no options and people who just wanted to know more and everyone in between. I really hope to inspire people to be more open about who they are. And then credit. Uh, most of the things I talked about here are from credible sources that I found anywhere on the internet. Um, whom I credited on a separate piece on my page. Um, but some of the things I just learned by trial and error or just by talking to others in the community, like in my interviews with Zephyr. Um, <laughs> okay, cool. All right. Um, as you've probably guessed or known, I'm a gay person who has access to enough gay sex education and access to a very supportive community. What more did I really need from this project? Um, why in the world would I go through all of this trouble? Honestly, I probably wouldn't have, but I need more people to feel this way. Due to my accessible and supportive community, I was able to have the courage to stand up to the system that so many are confined in. I also really hope that the system would be improved with my two younger brothers. And again, after lots and lots of research, I found the main causes of the issue. One, sex ed, extremely limited for LGBTQ students. Even in our school, it's short and not helpful to my fellow queer peers. The only ideas that we learn are gender expression versus gender identity, which could be helpful, yes, but it's also not fully in inclusive to our gay classmates. And it can often be the bare minimum, and I believe that we deserve better. We also need to learn about how our mental health is lowering due to the stigma around sex, sex education, specifically gay sex, and the stigma around how we learn what we need to stay safe and happy. And then we have violence against LGBTQ teens. I have learned that the amount of teenagers who are abused physically in this system are skyrocketing. 43.8% of lesbian and 61.1% of bisexual women <laughs> have experienced rape, physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner at some point in their lifetime. This is um, contrasted to the 35% of heterosexual women. 26% of gay and 37.3% of bisexual women men have experienced rape, physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner in their lifetime in comparison to the 29% of heterosexual men. And transgender people are more likely to experience intimate partner violence in public compared to people versus gender. And finally, the most important piece in my mind, awareness. The LGBTQ inclusive curriculum benefits all students by promoting acceptance and respect by teaching them more about the diverse people and families in the world. The anti-LGBTQ bias hurts all children. Beginning these conversations young will help adolescents develop empathy for the diverse and minorities. Students of all ages must be given an opportunity to learn the socially acceptable words describing people in the community, and they all deserve to see themselves in the curriculum. It allows, it acknowledges the reality that so many children are LGBTQ and it improves better academic and mental health outcomes. My posts. Other ideas that I included on my page included why we need sex education that is inclusive, STDs and STIs, options for transitioning at a young age, which includes subtopics like beginning stages of transitions, uh, non-medical transitions, and medical transitioning. Uh, pronouns, which includes a subtopic of neo-pronouns that includes an interview with two of my fellow students, chest binder information, dysphoria, which also includes an interview with two of my fellow classmates, and any uh, and how to help as an ally, which I will also present today, and extra ideas that my fellow my followers and viewers asked me to talk about. Next, I wanted to discuss the process of my posting. My favorite ones include how to help as an ally, non-medical transitioning, medical transitioning, and why we need uh, inclusive sex ed. Um, the first step of posting included extensive research. I spent two weeks researching each topic until it was to my satisfaction. After finishing, finishing my research, I wanted to make sure that my posts were different or that there were no more than two of the same posts. I carefully selected the background and theme from slidesgo.com, and after finding the one I loved and was happy with, I, okay, I'm ahead, um, I entered the information to my posts. 
This took up to a day because I needed to make sure that all my facts were checked, the fonts were the same, and all my spelling errors were non-existent. I have been indeed told that I'm a perfectionist. I promise I'm working on it. Um, after this, I started the process of posting it to my page by looking up the most popular hashtags at that time and making sure that I would find a variety in my audience. After making a lighthearted caption and making sure to cut it in my highlights, I was all set to post. My interviews. Um, what did I hope to achieve with my interviews? The first thing that I hoped to achieve was the exploration into the positives of experimenting. This first clip is of my friend Zephyr, right over there. Um, and Spark. There it is. Okay, cool. Okay. Um, well, I hope that some things in the LGBTQ community like STDs should be known and that people should be cautious about them. I did want to make sure that people knew that the best way to help yourself feel more comfortable is with experimenting. Things like labels and pronouns can only go so far with just research. Zephyr really helped me understand about how they came about their pronouns and even inspired me to do a little bit of experimenting myself. With an amazing person like them to inspire me, um, and positive po model positive um, experimenting, I felt as though many more will attempt to do so as well. Okay, cool. Uh, the second thing I hope to achieve with my interviews was to showcase people who are happy with who they are and how they live despite stigma. The next piece of my interview was also with Zephyr. Hope this one is smoother. I swear I did get permission to use this. Um. <laughs> And my last it's, it's bit. Still playing on YouTube. I'll always play. Cool. All right. Just hit exit. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> okay. Um, and for my last bit. Um, 
I think it went. Yeah, it did. It's just not full screen anymore. Whatever. Okay. We'll keep going. I got you. Okay. Um, finally, the last thing that I hope to achieve with my interviews was how to showcase people who struggle with the same things that you do. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. This next interview is with Parker August and Nico Fuse, um, who cannot be here today because uh, they have class. Uh, they helped me understand their dysphoria a little bit better, and I really want to thank them for being so brave to talk about something so personal to them. Um, with that being said, I thought it would be really important, all of you in the audience, for all of you in the audience to understand and take something away from this presentation, other than me just speaking boring facts about how I can improve our system. You see, I believe that change can also start with ourselves. We should take things away. Okay. Um, educate yourself. It's not our job to educate you. If you wish to become an ally or join in action such a, around such concerns, it is especially vital to understand about the oppression of marginalized groups to which you don't belong. Depending on their many overlapping identities, ex everyone experiences power, privilege, and oppression in different ways. Two, <laughs> check your privilege. Understanding your privilege can help you empathize with minorities. But not only that, defend others with your privilege. When it comes to sexual orientation, heterosexual people have an advantage over people with other sexual identity orientations because of cultural misconceptions that place them in dominant group over people who are homosexual, pansexual, asexual, and so on. While heterosexuals may face challenges in their lives, these challenges are unrelated to their sexual orientation. Don't assume anything. Don't assume that people are straight. Don't assume that they're cis. Don't assume that they use he, she pronouns. Prepare to change your thinking. We owe you nothing. Ignoring a person's pronouns can also imply that people who identify as transgender, non-binary, gender non-conforming do not exist. People can lessen the negative effects of social injustice by correctly utilizing their pronouns. Think of being an ally as an action and not a label. Oppression does not take breaks. Silence is not an option and you need to be consistent in your sports for LGBTQ people. Don't make jokes at the expense of someone's identity. Uh, confront prejudice. Being an ally means that you need to challenge any biases or assumptions that you have against the community. Confronting pre prejudice is frequently envisioned as a means of exerting control over injustices that would otherwise come from unchecked prejudice. Language matters. Um, just because it's acceptable to use certain words in your house, it doesn't mean that it's socially acceptable. Some words are socially unacceptable for a reason and you need to stop using them if they hurt others. And finally, know that you will mess up. I have messed up. Everyone in this room has messed up. Just apologize and move on. Apologize, correct yourself, and then move on. Don't make it about you. It can, it can make the person even more uncomfortable. There are so many things that you can do as an ally. Even if they're tiny, like correcting someone who used the wrong pronouns for a classmate, you can do more. And while my page is a great first step, and I believe that you should go check it out after this class, I believe that we should attempt to incorporate these lesson plans as soon as possible inside the classroom. 
While I, as a 16 year old student, don't have any impact on lesson plans, there are so many different credible sources to learn from. Lesson, the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Entertainment Network has an amazing curriculum that I've used as an inspiration for my lesson plans. But in order to figure out the new curriculum, I figured it would be nice to know what we could have improved first. I swear, this worked when I checked it this morning. <laughs> um, we need to first include trans education. Trans youth should we have the opportunity to know how to lessen dysphoria from safe, reliable sources. They should have access to safe binding, which is the binding of the chest to diminish dysphoria for assigned females at birth, safe hormone treatments with doctors and gender therapists, and they should understand how to support themselves through the expenses, expensive process. Furthermore, we should teach specific definitions that most allies do not understand, like the words cisgender, gender expression, and gender identity. We can always improve the system we have despite the backlash that we often face. Other improvements include a basic understanding of neo pronouns, which is a new category of pronouns to replace he, she, or they, multiple pronouns, um, and of the spectrum, which is an umbrella term for those whose uh, gender identity differs from their assigned sex at birth. And while I've informed all of you about my process and what you can do right now, I want to let you know what I want in the future. I hope to someday learn that there's a comprehensive sex ed in our school. This is because comprehensive sex ed has been shown to dramatically reduce the risk of suicide in our youth. By acknowledging our existence within sex ed programs, the administration is taking the first step into tackling the issue of high suicide rates. A quote that I really think sums up my arguments from the human rights campaign. When sex education is another area where LGBTQ youth are overlooked or actively stigmatized, it, can contrib it contributes to hostile school environments and places LGBTQ youth at increased risk for negative sexual health outcomes. Suicide risks will decrease with comprehensive sex ed. Over 40% of LGBTQ respondents seriously considered attempting suicide in the last 12 months, and with more than half gender, transgender and non-binary youth having seriously considered it. And we need to change the stigma around sex education. It's not a class where students learn to have sex. It never has been, not even for our straight classmates. It's a place where it can open conversations about homophobia, transgender options, and other, appropriate com other conversations that aren't appropriate for other classes. We need a sex ed that includes the queer community, as this is a great step in combating some of the discrepancies that we see in suicide rates and health outcomes. And while we may not be able to take this step for a while, I've decided to educate myself and others how to keep yourself healthy and as safe as possible. And this is also a place where you should be able to get answers about yourself and things that keep you safe. You should have access to a professional who knows how to help everyone. And while I know that this has been a seriously long speech, I say it's time to stop talking and start working. I'm not even just asking the students to help out their peers. I'm asking the teachers, the adults, and the grown-ups to help form this education curriculum that not only teaches but supports children that aren't otherwise supported because we are people too we deserve to have been taught the right way and we deserve to be protected thank you really yeah how did it make you feel to start posting educational content on instagram um, it was honestly a little terrifying at the time. Um, I've been kind of socially introverted my entire high school career and before, so I had no idea how people were going to react. Um, in fact, I didn't get any reaction at first. It took me about a week to figure out that I need to start following people on Instagram for them to start following me back. Um, and then I just followed like 175 people and I got like 75 followers in like a week. And then people started at least reading it, but I didn't really get anything until the eighth post or something when I started talking about how to help as an ally. And I think that I just didn't, like reaching out to my straight classmates just wasn't the best way to get that information. So if I told them, here's how you can help, they actually responded. <laughs> so I kind of answered your question. I don't know, Malik. Um, do you know how long it took you to kind of get um, like, well, that's a difficult question because, um, I think I spent like an entire day just making eight posts and then spent like an hour after that posting them one after another. And you might've seen that if you follow me, cause they're just one after another. And so 
like technically it took me a whole year to get the research, but like just making it took me like an hour for each post. Yeah. <laughs> How do you like respond to people? I just, I'm very interested in you're too young to be thinking like that, too young to make those decisions. Yeah. What do you, what do you answer that with? Like, how do you well, not argue? I just like, I disagree with that statement, first yeah. off. Um, I don't think you're ever too young to start conversations about homophobia. Um, sure, it can be inappropriate, but um, if my nine year old brother can get it, I think that anyone can get it. So I think just, start the conversation. If people react poorly, it's because they don't want to listen. It's not because it's too young. Yeah. Are you planning on Um, I kind of, I guess like if I come up with anything, I'll probably add something, but I'm not actively uploading it. I think I have 12 posts right now. And I think that like, that's where all my research was altogether. So I think that I don't have any more that I could upload, but like, like I said, if anyone asked me to upload it or ask me questions, I would definitely do that. Yeah. Yeah, it was really difficult. Um, there just isn't enough information out there, and that's why I wanted to do all of this. And so talking about dysphoria was the best way to get information about it because I just wasn't get me, getting anything because um, it's just such a personal thing. So I had to talk to people and understand how it was, and it was just – like, I got so much more information just by talking to people. <clears throat> what did you learn about yourself as a learner doing this capstone? Um, I learned a lot, mostly about how I procrastinate. Um, I kind of already knew that, but I didn't know how much I would procrastinate. I probably shouldn't be telling you this, seeing as you're grading me, but um, <laughs> I definitely spent a good solid month in the beginning just not really doing anything. I mean, I was thinking, but like, I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. And it just took me forever to like, come up with something. And I think I came to you in like March. And I was like, listen, Miss Felicia, I'm changing my entire thing. Mm -hmm. And you were just like, cool. <laughs> and it really helped me to like, figure that out on my own and really get to the point where I was like, um, I had to discipline myself or like my grades would suffer. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of the beauty of capstone. Yeah, like exactly. there is, you, you can take the time, you know, as, especially in a year long, you can take the time to like, yeah. get there. Yeah. I think you came up with something pretty cool. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Was this a year long or a semester? It was a year long. Yeah, but like. The same thing as semester is very important. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I think I probably spent just like a semester throughout the entire year, but like <laughs> I definitely did have a year. Any questions? All right, nice and tight.